Today, I bring you the top selling single issues of comic books of all time. Stay tuned. Hey, Wakandans, Kryptonians, and Gothamites, this is Dante D, and welcome to the channel where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. Before we get into that video, it's at this time of the show where I take a little bit of your time to ask you to please, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and check out my channel for other videos on topics related to comic books and geek culture. To all of you who have already subscribed, thank you for tuning in and for your continued support. I really enjoy hanging out with you guys here every time a video is posted. So as I said at the beginning, today we are looking at the top selling single issues of comic books of all time. Now when I say best selling comic books of all time, I really mean best selling comic books in the modern era. You see, during the golden age of comics, TV was a relatively new invention and not a lot of people had been exposed to it. Also, TVs at the time were not very accessible. I'm sure they were very, very expensive. So with no TV around, main forms of entertainment included radio and reading. And children specifically entertained themselves by reading comic books. So from the rise of the comic book medium all the way to about the 1950s, Sales figures for comic books were really, really good. We're talking millions. I mean, the first issue of Action Comics only had a print run of 250,000 comics. However, Superman grew in popularity. His titles could sell up to a million copies a month. By the time we get to the 1950s and subsequently the end of the Golden Age, sales start to plummet. Not only because by this time a television set is found in most homes, but also because of Frederick Wortham. And if you don't know who Frederick Wortham was, he was a psychiatrist who basically carried out a crusade against the comic book industry. He thought comic books were very poisonous for young minds and they were contributing to juvenile delinquency at the time. I don't want to spend too much time on Frederick Wortham, but people really listened to him and the comic book industry got hit very hard. By the time the Silver Age of comics began and the Marvel Age of comics was born, so the age where we were introduced to like Hulk, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, all the characters we know and love today, sales did recover a little bit but they never were as good as they were in the Golden Age. Some of the comics on this list do have a sales figure of about a million copies, but I just wanted to point out that by Golden Age standards, that's not really record-breaking. Sales data during the Golden Age and Silver Age of comics was also a little different and a little bit harder to come by as well. Today we have Diamond Comics, and Good Diamond Comics is really great about making comic book sales data available to the public. You can go on Diamond Comics' website and every single month they post a list of how many issues of a particular comic book were sold. So that's why today every single book on this list is from the modern era. And by the modern era, I mean from 1980s to present day. So let's get into this list. I'm going to name the comic, tell you how many copies it sold, and I'm going to explain to you what could have possibly contributed to such strong sales. Coming in at number 10, we have The Amazing Spider-Man 583. This is better known as the Obama comic. This comic here sold a whopping 530,000 copies. Now I know that may not sound like a lot, but let's just consider the fact that a very popular title like Batman or Spider-Man nowadays monthly maybe sells about 90,000 to 100,000 copies. Sales for Amazing Spider-Man 583 were driven not only by the fact that Barack Obama was running for president at the time and he was um, the first potential African-American president in American history. But the sales were also driven by the media. When this comic hit the shelves, the media ate it up. They reported on it and people got excited. Ottawa comic book stores are stocking up on the latest edition of Spider-Man. Why? Because he gets help from a powerful new friend. To other news now, Barack Obama is one politician who has a lot of fans. He's even reached superhero status in some circles. They went out and they bought what they thought was going to be a highly collectible comic. And this is even after the era of comic book speculation. Coming in at number nine, we have The Amazing Spider-Man number one. This is The Amazing Spider-Man number one from 2014. This particular comic here sold 533,000 copies. This is kind of one of the books that I was kind of really surprised to find on the list. As we all know that present day, Marvel and DC consistently relaunch their titles. Honestly, I think I want to call this era the era of relaunches. When they see their sales dwindling, they'll do a relaunch to get some speculation going and, and increase their sales. 
This was not the first relaunch of Amazing Spider-Man since 1963. What's really funny about this book is I think this relaunch of Amazing Spider-Man ran for about maybe, I think it was like eight or 10 issues or something. And then they relaunched it again with a new number one. By that point, I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. I'm totally done with reading new comics. Next up, coming in at number eight, we have the Deathmate series. The comic books in this series were not numbered. They were actually color-coded. And um, each one of these issues was estimated to have sold approximately 700,000 copies. However, although the sales on Deathmate were initially very good, I think it's safe to say that this joint endeavor by Valiant and Image was a total failure. And I say failure because this comic book was plagued with delays and late submissions and, and everything. Valiant, for the most part, was actually very good on submitting their work on time. However, Image Comics was terrible. And that, of course, is due to our buddy Rob Liefeld. There's actually an amusing story where Bob Layton, the then uh, editor of Valiant Comics, actually had to fly to Liefeld's house and he stood there on Liefeld's porch and would not leave until Liefeld finished the panels for his contribution to Deathmate. The strong sales on this book were mostly due in part to the hype over this event. We had Valiant and Image teaming up to do this huge crossover event of characters from their respective universes. People were super, super excited about the Deathmate crossover series. By the time the series was completed, fans were pissed off and they really just didn't care anymore. And the sales of the last few issues were terrible. And on top of that, I just might add, if you've ever read the Deathmate series, you will know that it sucks. I actually have Deathmate in my collection. I've tried reading it a couple times. That is time of my life I am never going to get back. Um, the prologue for Deathmate made sense, but the um, following issues made no sense at all. It was just a bunch of random crap going on. I'm like, I, I have no idea what's going on. Did you guys get anything out of Deathmate? Did you understand any sort of plot? I don't know. If you understood it, if you were smarter than me and understood what the heck was going on in Deathmate, please let me know in the comments. Next in, coming in at number seven is Fantastic Four, number 60. I have to admit, I was very, very surprised to find that this book was on the list. Before doing research for this video, I didn't even know this book existed. This issue of Fantastic Four sold 752,000 copies. When doing research for this video, I discovered that the strong sales for this comic book were likely contributed to the fact that this issue had a low nine cent cover price. Can you believe it? Nine cents. Fans could buy 20 copies of this particular issue and still not break the bank. We have Star Wars number one from 2015. This comic here sold just under a million copies, 958,000 copies. So why did people go crazy over Star Wars number one? This was the first time that Marvel Comics was publishing Star Wars since the 1970s. After Disney acquired the rights for LucasArts and Marvel Comics, they then came under the same umbrella and Marvel started publishing Star Wars again. On top of that, at the time, there was Star Wars fever. There was a new Star Wars movie coming out, The Force Awakens. People were so excited about Star Wars and they were buying up everything Star Wars. Furthermore, this particular issue here had 76 different variant covers. Is there anybody out there right now who actually bought 76 different copies of Star Wars number, number one? If you did, please let me know you are a trooper. Coming in at number five is Spawn number one with 1.7 million copies sold. Spawn number one is a book that you've seen in my videos before. It's one of my favorites. I absolutely love Spawn. And I think we all could surmise with great accuracy why this book did so well. Well, really, I think there are a few different contributing factors which resulted in strong sales for this book. One is the fact that Todd McFarlane was the artist on this. If you were around during the early 90s, you know that anything Todd McFarlane did, people ate it up. The two biggest rock star artists from the 1990s were Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee. If you were either Todd McFarlane or Jim Lee back in the 1990s, you literally could scribble on a paper, sign your name, print copies of it, and people would buy it. The excitement over this book was uncanny. McFarlane, superstar artist from Spider-Man, now in Image Comics, releasing his own original title. And I have to say, I actually really enjoyed Spawn. I love Spawn and I'm so happy to have it in my collection. On top of that, this was an Image Comics publication. 
people in the 1990s were testing the waters with Image. They really didn't know what Image was going to do in the future. So they wanted to buy up copies of Spawn just in case the value of Spawn skyrocketed. And of course, 1992, when Spawn number one came out, was probably the height of comic book speculation. Coming in at number four, we have another Todd McFarlane book. This is Spider-Man number one from 1990. Now, this is not Amazing Spider-Man. This is not Spectacular Spider-Man. Um, this is not Web of Spider-Man. This is just a self-titled Spider-Man comic, which Todd McFarlane was the lead on. This book here features Spider-Man and that famous pose that he made popular with his Amazing Spider-Man 300 and 301 covers. Again, I think we can all attribute the strong sales of this comic to the fact that Todd McFarlane was doing it in 1990 comic book speculation was kicking off. And also this particular issue here had five different variant covers. And especially if you're a speculator, you're not sure which cover is going to increase in value. So you're just gonna buy them all just to be safe. Coming in at number three is our only DC Comics book on the list. And that of course, I'm sure you've guessed it, is the death of Superman, Superman 75. This comic book here sold 3 million copies. And if you were around at the time, you probably know why this comic book did so well. Superman was the very first superhero. The first appearance of Superman in Action Comics number one, at the time in the 1990s, was selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the media was reporting on this. So when DC Comics announced that it would be killing the very first superhero of all time, people went nuts. The media ate it up. They were reporting on this like mad. Oh my goodness, DC Comics is killing Superman. Man of Steel has proven to be as vulnerable as the mere mortals who've looked up to him for more than half a century. Superman died Wednesday. So people thought if his first appearance is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, his death is going to be worth probably just as much. So people went out and bought multiple copies of the death of the first superhero of all time. You could probably still go on YouTube and find news reports from the time with people holding three copies of the death of Superman that they just bought saying, this one's going to be for my retirement. This one is going to put my kid through college. And this one is so I can buy a sports car eventually. But as we all know that everybody went out and did the same thing. So when you have 3 million copies of a particular comic book in circulation, it's not going to be very valuable. On top of that, I cannot forget to mention that this comic book here came in a poly bag. And if you were around at the time, you knew that in order for a particular comic book to maintain its collectability, it had to stay in its original packaging. So if you were a fan at the time and you wanted to read this comic book, but also have it as a collectible, you had to buy two copies. One to open up and read, and also one to keep as a collectible. Coming in at number two is a book that's been in a few of my other videos. That is X-Force number one with a whopping five million copies sold. And as we all know, X-Force number one was by, are you ready for it? Rob Liefeld. Let's just reflect on that for a second. A comic book that Rob Liefeld both wrote and drew is the number two best-selling comic of all time, and five million copies were sold. God, you gotta love the 90s. <laughs> Whether you like him or you hate him, Rob Liefeld was also a very popular artist at the time, and whenever he was putting out, people were buying up. He rose to fame and fortune with his work on the New Mutants, and as we all know, X-Force is the title that followed the New Mutants. So people were super excited to see what Rob Liefeld would do next. Coming in at number one, I'm sure this is not gonna be a big surprise to any of you. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you've seen this book multiple, multiple times in my videos, and I've said this stat probably every time I've used this book in my videos. Number one is X-Men number one by Jim Lee from 1991. This book here sold approximately eight million copies. Next to Todd McFarlane in the 1990s, Jim Lee was the guy to be. Everybody loved Jim Lee and his work on X-Men. And I think even publishers were telling some of their artists, try to draw like Jim Lee. The success of this book was due not only in part to Jim Lee, but also to the fact that this book had five different variant covers. And um, if you have all the variant covers um, and you put them all together, they kind of make like this like huge panorama portrait, which is which is kind of cool. I thought it was kind of cool. Always keep in mind that because X-Men's number one sold 8 million copies does not mean that 8 million people were actually reading X-Men. 
I'm sure there were maybe only half a million readers and then there were probably a few hundred thousand other people that were just buying up this book as an investment and both readers collectors and speculators were buying up multiple copies of this particular comic just in case it went up in value this is also I believe the first X-Men number one since the 1960s so people were like oh my goodness I I gotta get this book because X-Men number one from the 1960s is, is, is quite an expensive book. So if I buy this new X-Men number one, you know, and I give it 10 years, it's going to be worth a lot of money too. And, and, and I'll be able to cash in on that. So I'm sure by now, as we're ending this video, you're probably seeing a trend here that a lot of the books on this list came out of that era of comic book speculation. So what are your thoughts on the comics that appeared in this list? Let me know in the comments. And if you have any other cool tidbits of information on some of these books, please let me know. That about does it for our video today. I really, really hope you enjoyed it. And I thank you all for hanging out with me today. Until next time, this is Dante D signing off. Ciao.